Well, good morning to all of you today. We're glad that you're here, and uh, we, uh, we so love worshiping together, and it's a joy uh, to sing to the Lord uh, together with you. Would you, before we begin uh, to look into Scripture this morning, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Our Father, you are so good to us. Lord, you, uh, you provide everything we need for life. Lord, you protect us. You guide us every day, Father. You, uh, you sustain uh, our heartbeat and our breath, our health. You give us all things we need, Father, to, uh, to have a place to live and to eat. And Father, we're just uh, so thankful for all those things. Father, this morning, um, we want to acknowledge the fact that you are the source of everything, Lord. We don't want to take for granted the various ways that, uh, that you provide. Father, for our families, the jobs that you give us, the nation we live in, Father, we are so thankful for this country that you've given us for those who serve her, for our leaders that you've commanded us to pray for, Lord, we ask that you would bless them, that you would give them wisdom. And Father, we ask that you watch over those who protect her, Father, our policemen and firemen and members of the military, Lord. Protect them not only from harm, Lord, but uh, protect them from the devil, protect them from the evil one who wants to destroy them. Father, this morning as we prepare to dive into your word, Lord, we ask that you give us open hearts and minds to learn that which you would have for us. Father, we stand before you on equal footing this morning. Lord, we are uh, before your word, which is our textbook, your Holy Spirit, our instructor. And we together are your students, Lord. Would you open our eyes this morning and our hearts to receive what you would have to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. We have uh, been for some time in a series entitled, This Changes Everything. And we are in part number nine this morning of that series. And I want to just very briefly in about two to three minutes just go through with you where we've been and where we're going. We first spoke about what does Jesus want from me. And in this we talked about the personal cost of discipleship. What does it cost to follow Jesus, it's not just a simple, uh, a simple uh, accepting Him as Lord and Savior, but it is a giving of our lives to Him. And then secondly, we asked, what is the thing that changes everything? And we discovered that the thing that changes everything is our obedience, our obedience and then we asked, how can we become the change? In other words, how do we get from a point where we understand that obedience is necessary to a point where we can actually obey from the heart, not just out of compulsion, not just, not just uh, uh, doing uh, something for the hand or from the foot or from the mouth, but actually from the heart living these things. And then we discovered the practical power of prayer, how that nothing happens without prayer. It is impossible that we as a church would grow or that we would reach our community with the gospel of Christ because it is a spiritual battle and it must be won on a spiritual plane. And so absolutely nothing can happen unless we become a house of prayer, unless we ourselves individually are people of prayer, And this is why, by the way, we ask that every one of you who have any part at all to do with New Hope would join us every Sunday at 4 p.m. for one hour of prayer, seeking the Lord's face. 
And then we spoke of the radical results of relational evangelism. The radical results of relational evangelism, meaning that we must live a lifestyle of evangelism in order to make disciples. It's not enough to have a concert or bring a speaker in or have an event or have a really good worship service or pass out a bunch of flyers or tracts. That doesn't really work. It works to a limited degree. But you see, if we're going to actually do what Jesus said in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, we've got to be relational in our evangelism. And then last week we discussed the discipline of discipling, the discipline of discipling, how that every believer must be discipling others to be more like Christ while ourselves being discipled by someone who is showing us how to get closer to Christ. This week in part nine of this series, and there's only two more parts, there's this week and next week. In part nine this week, we are talking about the heart of hospitality because when we comprehend the heart of hospitality, it begins to change everything. What is hospitality? We've heard the word thrown around. We've heard various versions of it. What is, what is biblical hospitality? Well, hospitality itself can be defined as the quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests and strangers in a warm, friendly, and generous way. Throughout history, believers in Christ, did you know, would open their homes regularly to have people stay with them. Those who were passing through the country, those who were traveling and didn't uh, have a place to stay. And in fact, it became so much of a practice for the church it became so much of a practice for the church to open their homes to those who are traveling and to the needy and to the hungry and to the sick and to the poor that they eventually became known, these people's homes eventually became known as hospitals. You say, wow, what does that have to do with a hospital? Well, it was the Christian church that started hospitals in the 5th century because they were a haven for guests. You see, that was the original t intent. Long before the church, you see, had pulpits and baptistries, she had kitchens and dinner tables and living rooms. And in fact, our word hospital comes from the word hospice in Latin, which means a home used for a haven of rest. You see, in the New Testament Greek, as we go into to what the Greek says when it uses the term hospitality, the term hospitality literally means in the Greek, love of strangers. That's what the word hospitality actually means in Scripture, is love of strangers. Hospitality is a virtue in Scripture both commanded in Old Testament and New Testament. And it is both commanded and commended. Now, usually when we think of hospitality, we sometimes come to the place where we think, you know, perhaps I'm not gifted in that. Perhaps that's not my calling, that's not my thing, I mean, I know there's other people that are good at that and like it. Maybe they even enjoy it. But, you know, it's just, just me. It's not really my thing. You see, here's the deal. Not everyone can serve necessarily in a foreign land as a missionary. Not everyone may have the ability to lead a mass relief effort or volunteer uh, uh, working hours all day long at a soup kitchen. But all of us can be hospitable. All of us can and should be hospitable. And the question is, if you have a front door, if you have a table, if you have chairs, if you have bread and maybe meat for sandwiches, then congratulations, you've just qualified to serve in the most ancient and important of ministries, hospitality. 
You see, throughout the Old Testament, it was specifically commanded by God. Leviticus 19.33, for example, says, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When Job, you remember the story of Job who became afflicted with all sorts of ailments and sicknesses and diseases and he lost his money and he lost his health and he lost his family and he lost everything. And in the midst of Job's uh, speaking to God uh, in the Old Testament as he was protesting his sickness, one of the virtues that he said he never neglected was hospitality. Job 31, 32, the sojourner has not longed in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. And that's not surprising because the Lord himself said that Job was an upright man who feared God and turned away from evil in Job 1, 1. And as far back as you want to go in history, God's people, his have had as their appointed duty hospitality. Now, how about the New Testament? Is that maybe just a thing for back then? How about the New Testament? 1 Timothy 5, 10 through 11 says something interesting. Now, 1 Timothy 5, 10 through 11 talks about the qualifications necessary for the church to consider a widow a widow so that they would like take care of her and, and, and take care of her needs and her food and her housing and her money and whatever. And it gives this, it says, having a reputation for good works if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality. Isn't that interesting? In other words, it's saying, look, if you have a woman there and she's a widow and she's coming to you for help, if she has not shown hospitality, don't consider her a widow. Don't put her on the list. Isn't that strange? We look at in the New Testament qualifications for those who are to serve as elders in a church. And did you know that one of the qualifications in order to be able to function as an elder, to serve as an elder, to take that role in that position, is that you must be hospitable, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2. An overseer, therefore, must be respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. Titus 1, 6 through 8, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but must be hospitable. You see, you're getting the idea as we move along that God kind of is taking this thing seriously. We start getting the idea that maybe it's not just a, well, you know, if I feel like it and everything's fine and the circumstances are good and everything's working okay, I can maybe invite someone over that I really like if it's not a big deal and if I'm not too inconvenienced. And See, that's not at all hospitality in Scripture. And hospitality is commanded within the church. Romans 12, 9 through 13 says this, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I'm trying to get my kids to understand that. They don't quite get it. Anyway, uh, do, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And, oh, by the way, at the very end, last but not least, show hospitality. See, it's commanded. It's not an option. It's not an option. Hebrews 13, 1 through 4 shows that we should show hospitality not only to one another here as a church, as a body of believers, but we should show hospitality to complete strangers. Hebrews 13, 1 through 4, let brotherly love continue, did not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. You say, how does that work? I mean, I, if he's a stranger, that means I don't know the guy. Catch this. I want you to catch this. If he's a stranger, I don't know him. That's what the word stranger means, right? If you don't know him or her, then that means you cannot know what their background is. 
What if they're a murderer? What if they're a crazed drug addict? What if they're a lunatic? What if they're a child molester? See, you can't know a stranger. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. This passage, by its very nature, infers of necessity that there's risk involved. It infers of necessity that there is risk involved when you take in a stranger. And Luke, Luke 14, Jesus says something very interesting. He said also to the man who had invited him, look, when you give a dinner or a banquet, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, you know when you do that big barbecue in the backyard? Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Why? Why will you be blessed? It tells you. Because they cannot repay you. They have no means of repaying you. You say, well, why should I do it then if they have no means of repaying me? For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just, you see. This morning, I want to present to you four quick ideas, four quick points about hospitality. First, the duty to hospitality. Our own duty to hospitality. Romans 12, 13 says, contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. That word practice there that you see in your Bible, the literal word there is to pursue, to run after, to chase after, to diligently seek out relentlessly. Like you picture a, a police officer pursuing somebody. You know, he doesn't just see him go by and says, eh, it's going to be kind of hard to catch him, I'll just let it go. You don't see that much. He chases after him. And even if he's thwarted and even if he loses him, he just runs after him and runs after him. This is the picture portrayed here. It's not the idea of, you know, go ahead, give it a shot. If you like, if it's okay, you know, if you feel up to it, try it. See if you like it. It is the idea that we must pursue hospitality. The verb implies continuous action. It's not a once a year thing. It's not a Thanksgiving thing. It's not a Christmas thing. It's not a Super Bowl party thing. You see, here's the attitude we must have. And it really is a paradigm shift is what it really is. The attitude we must have is that our homes should stand constantly ready for hospitality. My kids wonder why I tell them to pick up their rooms, you know, <laughs> clean up the bathroom, make sure everything's... And, and, and when I tell them that, I say, make sure the house is ready to receive guests. Right, guys? I always say that. Ready to receive guests. Why? So that we're always ready, you see, for anyone to come in. Let me tell you what hospitality is not, because I don't want you to be confused this morning. Hospitality is not a calling that only certain individuals have. It is a discipline to be developed by every single Christian. Hebrews 13, let brotherly love continue, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Romans 12, 13, we should be consistent in our practice of hospitality. And Hebrews says the same thing, by the way, in a negative way. It says, do not neglect it. And because Hebrews says, do not neglect it, it is evidently something that very easily can fall into neglect. 
have you ever caught yourself saying or thinking, you know, I don't really have the gift of hospitality. It's not my thing. I want to read you a quote uh, by a popular pastor. He said this. Listen to this. Quote, I used to see hospitality as a gift or as a calling that others had, but that I did not have. For many years, I saw my home as a castle a place for seclusion, safety, and relaxation. I dreamed of a pristine home finely decorated and designed for my own enjoyment. This selfish dream brought loneliness to my wife and encouraged my kids to be self-indulgent and to have an independent spirit. Over the past several years, God has miraculously and graciously broken this cycle in my life. Are you there? Have you been there? I can tell you I have. I can tell you I have. I used to think of my home as my castle. I'll go work out there, but when I get home, I'm shutting and locking the doors, and I don't want anybody to bother me. You see, because you and I are both human, it's the most natural thing in the world for us to neglect hospitality. It just comes naturally to neglect it. It comes naturally to run away from it. Because hospitality requires forethought. It requires effort. And we, of course, prefer the path of least resistance. Listen to these words by John Piper pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church, one of the largest churches in the United States, he says, all we have to do is yield to the natural gravity of our self-centered life, and the result will be a life so full of ourselves that there is no room for hospitality. Hmm. You see, hospitality... <laughs> I, read the, I read this funny, funny, uh, funny uh, saying, and I, and I have, to, have to read it to you because it's so true, but it, but it is hilarious. It says, the art, hospitality is the art of making your guests feel at home, even if you wish they were. I love it. Secondly, we have to practice hospitality. What is the practice of hospitality? See, when we look at hospitality, we have to start thinking in strategic terms. We have to think of what is strategic hospitality. This is a hospitality that asks, how can I draw the most people into a deep experience of God's hospitality by the use of my home or my church home? It asks, who might need for example, uh, some, some help, some encouragement, some reinforcement, who's maybe out, uh, uh, out there feeling, uh, battling against loneliness. Would they like to come to my home? Who are the people who could be brought together in my house most strategically for the sake of the kingdom? What two or three people's abilities might uh, work well together to form a new ministry? What person, catch this, what person is God placing in my path for me to be a conduit of his love to them? You see, we sometimes get confused over what hospitality is in the practice of hospitality. When we're talking about practicing hospitality, we sometimes get confused. We think we're practicing hospitality and we, we're not. How can we get confused? Like this. We can think that we're practicing, for example, hospitality by, you know, inviting the old clan over. You know who they are, right? They come over all the time. Sometimes you have a good time. If they're in-laws, maybe not, right? Okay, the old clan. You have them over for dinner. Same people you've had again and again and again. That's not hospitality. 
Hospitality is not getting together with a group of your closest friends and going out weekly to a restaurant. That's not hospitality. It's not throwing a Super Bowl party for all the people that you love hanging out with. That's not hospitality. You see, real biblical hospitality strategizes how to make the hospitality of God known and felt to those who may need it most. And it often and almost always requires sacrifice on our part. Whether it's a lonely church member, a newcomer to New Hope, the poor, the hungry, the sick, the imprisoned out in Sierra Vista, those are the people we need to be showing hospitality to. I want to, before we move on to the next one, I want to answer one question that uh, we may have in our minds. And it's an important question. And that is this. What does hospitality have to do with God? See, we have to get this straight in our minds, and here's why. Because after all, we're in a worship service here, right? We're at church. We're not in a seminar on uh, successful living. We're not in a seminar on how to win friends and influence people. And I see no reason why Christians, why you and I as Christians ought to be interested in mere morality that is not related to Christ. If I understand the words of Jesus in Matthew 23, 15 at all, then I also understand that hell will be largely populated by people who are very moral, but who had no love for Christ. So as pleasant as the habit of hospitality may be, the question is this. What does it have to do with God? What gives Christian hospitality its eternal value and sets it off from mere popular morality, from merely a good thing to do? And the answer to that question will be answered when we ask, why do we do it? What is our motivation for hospitality? See, this right here is the crux of the whole issue. We can sit here all day and talk about methods and forms of of hospitality and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it and all that. But you see, the issue is the motivation for hospitality because if we miss this, we miss the whole boat. You see, because our motivation matters. So what is, after all, as the sermon is titled, what is the heart of hospitality? The motivation behind it. Well, I tell you what it cannot be. It cannot be something that we do out of guilt. It cannot be something that we do because the pastor's up here and he said it's good to do, so I I guess I better play along. It's not something that we can ever, ever do so that other people look at us and say, oh boy, look at they're pretty good. It can never be done grudgingly. It can never be done out of mere duty. Our only motivation to practice hospitality, our motivation to practice hospitality must, must come from a love and a gratitude to God for what he's done for the sake of promoting his glory. Out of a love and gratitude for what God has done for the sake of promoting his glory. You see, the God-centered motivation for hospitality really begins in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19.33, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong, and it goes on, and it says, you shall love him as yourselves. Why? See, that's the part we have to answer. Why should you love him as yourself? Because you also were strangers in Egypt. What did the Lord do when we were strangers in Egypt? You see, today we're we're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a little bit. We're going to take this this Lord's Supper, this, this, this bread and this wine that Jesus used to establish through, uh, used as an opportunity to establish this Lord's Supper through a meal called the Passover, which, of course, commemorated 
the fact that God saved his people from slavery in Egypt. You see, ultimately, God is the one who shows ultimate hospitality. Taking a stranger in as your own is what God did. And that's what we ought to do. And of course, the ultimate act of hospitality was when Jesus died for sinners to make everyone who believes a member of the household of God. We're no longer strangers. We're not just some guy out there on the street. We have come home to God. And everyone who trusts in Jesus finds a home in God. And why did God do it? Why did God send his only son to die so that sinners could have hospitality in heaven? For his glory. Ultimately, all things are for the glory of God. And so you and I look back and we remember that we owe our very lives to an act of God's hospitality. Ephesians 2.8 says, By grace you are saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. The ultimate foundation for Christian hospitality is God's glory and God's grace. Ephesians 1, 5 through 6, He destined us in love to be His sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glory and grace. You see, grace is the hospitality of God to welcome, the hospitality of God working through us to welcome sinners, not because of, of, of their goodness, not because they look good or they smell good or they're appealing or we think we're going to have a good time with them or they have kind of a similar personality or, you know, we like the same sports team. But it is us showing to them the same love that God showed to us. For Scripture says, for while we were yet sinners, you see, while we were ugly, He sent His Son to die for us. God's hospitality is motivated by a commitment to the glory of His own name. Scripture says, I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned. And unless we can see this, we'll never really understand the meaning of grace or the motivation for hospitality. So hospitality is a command. It's a command to not just do certain things, and here's where I don't want you to get railroaded. I don't want you to get sideswiped here. Hospitality is not, biblical hospitality is not just a command to do certain things. It's not just a command to open your, your house and to feed a meal and to take a stranger in and to give them a warm bed. It, it, that's not it. You say, well, you lost me there. I'm about to get you back. Here's why. It is not just a command to do a certain kind of thing. Hospitality, biblical hospitality, is a command to be a certain kind of person. That is the key. 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9, Above all, hold unfailing love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Therefore, practice hospitality ungrudgingly to one another ungrudgingly. That means to be the kind of people who do it and like to do it. To do it and like to do it because we see the motivation for doing it. If you are going to invite someone homeless or someone needy or someone that's walked into our service this morning and you're inviting them to your home for lunch this afternoon, please, please do not do it because the pastor's up here telling you to do it. Don't do it out of guilt. Don't do it out of compulsion. Do it out of your love 
for what God has already done for you in order to promote His glory and His grace. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says this, for the love of, catch this, this is great, I love this. For the love of Christ controls us. Some versions say compels us. For the, what is it that controls us? What is it that compels us? It's the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who for their sake died and was raised. See, that's the deal. That must be the motivation for our hospitality. Now, lastly, let me leave you with this. What are the results of hospitality? What are the results of hospitality? What, what actually happens? What actually happens when you and I as individuals start seeing the motivation and start living out hospitality in our daily lives? What happens? And what happens when we as a church are empowered and, and motivated and, 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 and sent out to do hospitality. What happens then? Well, first, let's talk about what happens to others. Let's, what, let's talk about what happens to those to whom we show hospitality. They are shown the love of Christ. You see, it's not merely spoken to them, but demonstrated to them in tangible ways so as to make the message of the gospel believable and our claim to love them, credible. You know, I've shared the gospel with my mom many times in my life. And one of the things she keeps saying to me over and over and over again, when I back her in the wall, when I've explained all the questions, uh, answered every objection, she always, at the end, comes and says, you know, that's all really good. But there's one problem. I've known too many Christians. What do you think she's saying there? What do you think she means there? See, what she's saying is, we say one thing and we live another way. What she's saying is there's a disconnect between what we preach and what we advertise and what we put on the internet and put on flyers and put on signs out here and what we actually live. That's what she's saying. You see, it is not merely spoken of. The gospel cannot merely be spoken of, but actually must be demonstrated to people in tangible ways so as to make the message of the gospel believable and our claim to love them credible. Next, what does it do for the church? What is the result of hospitality to the church? Well, first, it's absolutely necessary. It is absolutely indispensable. It is absolutely essential to our effectiveness in the spread of the gospel. And this church will never, ever, ever grow until we learn biblical hospitality. Because talk is cheap and actions speak louder than words. Oh, we can say all we want. Oh, we love you. We welcome you. Oh, come to New Hope. We love everyone here. We welcome everyone here. Do you really? Show me. Show me. Let's see. Because you see, the people are waiting to see it. They don't want to see it on the front of our bulletins. They want to see it in their lives. Let me ask you this. How many times do you think? It's just a question. How many times do you think someone new will come and visit New Hope? before they conclude that we really don't care for them if we haven't demonstrated our love by hospitality. Max Licato says this. <laughs> it's kind of funny that I'm quoting Max Licato this morning. My son is in uh, San Antonio this morning and he calls me this morning and he's attending Max Licato's church this morning, listening to him preach, so... He's got, you know, he used to say, uh, he, says, he says, Dad, uh, 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 you're, uh, you're my favorite preacher. 
I'm kind of worried about that now. <laughs> Max Licato says this, quote, Something holy happens around a dinner table that will never, ever happen in a sanctuary. It will never happen in a church auditorium. Because at church, you see the backs of heads. Around a table, you see the expressions on faces. In the auditorium, one person speaks. Around the table, everyone has a voice. Church services are on the clock. But around the table, there is time to talk. Mm. That's what it does for the church, folks. It makes it possible for people to see the love of Christ. Next. What does it do for us individually? Like, like, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this deal? Therefore, when we practice hospitality, we experience the refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality to others. You ever experienced the joy of sharing God's love with someone else? You see, this is how you do it. The joy of receiving God's hospitality in us, see, because we've all received God's hospitality, right? But that joy of receiving God's hospitality decays and dies quickly in us when we don't spread it to others. When we practice hospitality, we experience something. We experience the thrill of feeling God's power work through us to conquer our own fears, to conquer our own stinginess, to conquer our own self-centeredness in order to increase the joy of our faith and promote the glory of God. And what does it do for our families? Like if we, if we actually stepped out of our box and started practicing hospitality, even though it may be uncomfortable at first, if we actually said, you know, Lord, you've done so much for me and I love you so much and I'm so grateful and so thankful for you saving me. Lord, what can I do but show hospitality? If we actually started doing that, what would happen to our families? You see, living a lifestyle of hospitality has tremendous benefits for your family, among which are, there are many, but a couple are these. One, our home, the place that we live, the place that we consider like the hub, the core of where everything happens, right? That central place in our lives is transformed from a place to merely eat, sleep, and entertain ourselves. It is transformed into a center of ministry, a conduit of God's love. And this profoundly affects our view of our possessions and our view of life and our view of ourselves and our view of our purpose. How about our kids? What do you think happens to our kids? You see, children... Because we love them, and rightly so, we, we, we want to baby them. It's our natural predisposition, you know, to kind of want to baby them and, and nurture them and protect them from everything and give them all the best and lavish on them everything. And those, those are good things. But here's what can happen when that gets out of the c control. Kids, and you know this, can very easily start seeing themselves as the center of the universe. And they start seeing the goal of life as being what? Personal entertainment, right? Am I losing any of you? You got kids, right? See, personal entertainment, fun. What are we going to do next? What are we going to do, Dad? What are we going to do, Mom? Can we go to the theater? Can we do this? Are we gonna, what are we going to eat? Are we going to go on a vacation? Are we going to do this? Can we get, buy me that game? Can I, right? Kids, got to love them. Okay, so the kids through no fault of their own because they're born sinful and we make it worse. Through no fault of their own, they start to see themselves as the center of the universe. What they need to do 
is through hospitality, through you modeling hospitality in your home, they begin to see themselves in healthy ways. They gain a healthy perspective of their own significant role in God's kingdom as they begin to consider the needs of others above their own needs. And when this happens, you'll have new kids. You see, all this and many more things make for a healthy environment as our families learn to serve God together through hospitality. And lastly, to God, our hospitality brings Him glory and honor. The glory and honor that He is rightfully due when we live out and show forth and pass on His grace which he has already given to us. See, it's not like we're creating something here and giving it to God. All we're doing is simply taking what he's already given to us and we're just passing it on. We're just a conduit. You see, those power lines running to your house, they don't create the electricity. It's created somewhere down the road. Those things just take it to you. See, we need to be taking the love of Christ to our community. for His honor, for His glory, and for His namesake. Father, this morning we ask, Lord, that You would help us to understand what it means to show hospitality. Father, reveal to us, Lord, what You have in mind when You speak of showing hospitality. And Father, more than that, Give us the strength, the resolve, the determination to run after, to intensely pursue a life of hospitality. Not because we feel guilt, not because we're trying to earn anything from you, because we can earn nothing from you, Lord, for you have done everything for us. But Lord, out of sheer joy, out of sheer thankfulness, out of sheer love, out of sheer gratitude for what you have done for us and the hospitality that you have lavished upon us, let us be a conduit of that to show hospitality to others. For the glory and the sake and through the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.